Good afternoon and welcome to the Greater North Dakota Chamber's 2020 Policy Summit. I'm Eric Spencer, GNDC's President and CEO. This is the ninth run of this event and the first time it's ever been a virtual production. It's safe to say that we never planned to have this event hosted online, but in doing so, overhaul the entire format to offer a more casual conversation to get to the heart of big issues facing our state. We thank you, our attendees, for supporting this new style, and we also thank our event sponsors, because without their support, this event wouldn't take place. Special call out to our silver level sponsors, which include BNSF Railway, Ottertail Power Company, Touchstone Energy Cooperative, as well as all other sponsors for their support. This is the second panel session of our 2020 Policy Summit series and focuses on the hospitality industry, which has been deeply impacted by COVID-19. But first, a few housekeeping items. We are broadcasting live from the Dakota Carrier Network facility right here in Bismarck, North Dakota, and anticipate this panel will last about one hour. Bios of our moderator and panelists are listed below. Attendees can submit questions at any time, which will be sent to the panel moderator. To do this, please use the Q&A tab on the right side of your screen. There you'll also see a chat tab. Use that to interact with other attendees. The chat moderator, who will be commenting on this panel, engaging with attendees, and providing another expert opinion will be Justin Fisk, Marketing and Communications Director for the Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt Medora Foundation. Thank you, Justin. With that, I'd like to introduce our panel moderator, Rudy Martinson, Executive Director of the North Dakota Hospitality Association. Rudy. Good thank, afternoon. And thank you, Eric, and thank North you to the North Dakota, Dakota, Dakota <clears throat> Greater North Dakota Chamber for hosting this event and for inviting the Hospitality Association and our group of panelists from uh, the, across a broad spectrum, spectrum of the hospitality industry uh, to participate today. I believe we'll begin with just some introductions. As Eric mentioned, I am Rudy Martinson, Executive Director of the North Dakota Hospitality Association, which is the state's trade organization for the restaurant, lodging, and retail beverage industries. And we have, uh, we have represented those industries in Bismarck uh, and at the state capitol and around the state in one form or another since 1955. Um, I will also introduce my fellow panelists this morning, starting with Dusty Jensen. Uh, who is with Applebee's and once we go through um, all these introductions I'll give everyone kind of a chance to give a background on their company and, and the impact, market impact that uh, each company has in North Dakota. Um, next is Lisa Hickson Molson with Regency Hotel Management. We also have Representative Mike LaFour, proprietor of Blue 42 out of Dickinson, North Dakota and Shannon McQuaid, Eli of McQuaid Distributing here in Bismarck. So to kick off the conversation, um, obviously the, the bios are available uh, online for the viewers, um, but I wanted to just kind of go through e to each of our panelists and potentially in the order that uh, I just introduced you um, and just talk a little bit about uh, the scope of your business within North Dakota, uh, how many locations do you have, um, what's the geographical diversity of your footprint and just kind of in a pre-COVID world, uh, what did your operation look like here in North Dakota? So I'll start with Dusty on that one. Thanks, Rudy. Um, we've got uh, 12 Applebee's here in the state of North Dakota from Williston to Fargo to Grand Forks to Dickinson. So we hit every, every corner, every road. Uh, we also operate Qdoba restaurants in North Dakota, uh, predominantly on the west side of the state, Dickinson, Williston, uh, Minot. Um, Pre-COVID, you know, everything was pretty, pretty fine and dandy. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, business as usual, we have had to learn quickly to do stuff differently from the social distancing to, um, you know, health checks inside the restaurant to uh, switching our business from predominantly dine-in to, for a few weeks, predominantly an all-dine-out, uh, carry-out to-go delivery. Um, we have had to do that in all of our concepts, and it's been, uh, it's definitely been a challenge, and it's been uh, interesting. Thank you, Dusty, and we will uh, we'll dive a little further into several of those issues over the course of the panel. I want to um, give Lisa Hickson Molson from Regency Hotel Management the same opportunity to talk a little about, bit about the uh, background to your company and, and presence in North Dakota. Sure. Um, my company um, is Regency Hotel Management. We manage um, four hotels in North Dakota, uh, two being in Bismarck, the Radisson Hotel and the Ramcota Hotel and Conference Center and then uh, one in Fargo, Clubhouse Hotel and Suites, and we also manage the Grand Hotel in Minot. 
um, you know, pre-COVID, we were very excited at what 2020 was looking like. Um, we, we were, you know, looking at pacing way ahead of last year. Um, and then COVID hit. And I tell you what, it is something that nobody, I mean, obviously nobody could ever expect it, but um, the way that business wiped out when a, within a matter of a day, literally, we saw cancellations, hundreds of cancellations come in for groups and it just continued to go from there. And now um, we, you know, we're seeing a little uptick with leisure travel, um, but uh, the group and the business travel is, is um, it's hard to come by right now. So we're, uh, we're just hoping for the best. Sure, thanks Lisa. We will, uh, we'll go to Mike LaFour for an intro to him and his business. Well, thank you, Rudy, and thank to the Greater North Dakota Chamber for hosting these panels. Uh, Blue 42 uh, Sports Grill and Bar has been in business for just over three years. And prior to that, uh, about a year, year and a half prior to that, we started the planning process uh, to move that forward. And I'll tell you, the, the first three years were very, very good. And um, so we're looking at expansion, doing other things. I think what uh, the COVID did f to us is that it forced us to become better operators. We were not in takeout, carryout. Um, we were not doing catering, and that forced us to change our business plan to accommodate that because when we're closed for about six weeks or we're uh, down to 50% capacity, it, it forced us to look for other revenue sources and that is catering and takeout and so forth. So right now we're doing okay. Um, obviously when we are shut down, uh, we're down uh, substantially but I'll tell you, we're, we're tracking about where we were last year at this time, so we feel very good about that. We run two restaurants in Dickinson and, um, uh, it, and have learned a lot in that time frame. And so it's all about customer service and um, giving the customer what they want. And we've done worked hard at that, as, as have the other panelists here with you today. And, and we remain hopeful, obviously, that there'll be a vaccine sooner than later. And, but we all have to, uh, again, what they say, plan for the worst and hope for the best. And so far, uh, we're doing all right. Excellent. And Shannon, your, your kind of opening perspective from over at McQuaid's? Yeah, so my uh, company is McQuaid Distributing out of Bismarck. Our footprint is basically uh, central uh, North Dakota into the, uh, to the border of South Dakota. And how <coughs> my business differs a little bit is we, uh, the hospitality industry is my customer. You all are my customers or, in theory, other businesses like mine. Um, so we are service providers uh, providing beer, um, to the hotels and, and restaurants and bars. And um, on a side note, we do host a, a very large event that happens in Bismarck on an annual basis. And uh, 2020 would have been the 45th anniversary of the Sam McQuaid Senior Budweiser Charity Softball Tournament. So, um, you know, I kind of have both perspectives with the events as well. Pre-COVID, uh, the beer industry was not doing very well the last couple of years, just some different, you know, all kinds of different uh, reasons behind that but um, finally we'd kind of mm -hmm. seen an uptick in sales and things were going well until uh, middle of March. I mean St. Patty's Day is our kind of <laughs> big first great holiday of, of the beer drinking world and uh, a few days after that um, North Dakota was shut down in the on-premise and we really had to scramble quite a bit um, to now while half of our half of our businesses right were pretty pretty excited i mean the pantry loading was happening that was a real thing um, people were going to the off-premise and uh, they weren't buying beer quite like they bought toilet paper um, <laughs> but but they were doing a good job of buying beer um, that said just uh, the way that people um, consumed um, beverages for that month and a half over over shutdown really affected our supply chains and I imagine I know like to-go boxes and things like that our supply chains were flipped upside down as as were many industries and I'm um, just trying to get through that and making sure that you know we were still trying to provide a job and employment for the people you know that now what's our on-premise salesperson going to do when he has no stops so um, it's it's been a real interesting time um, it it as Lisa said, I mean, unprecedented. We are all waiting for precedent in times. I saw that meme and I totally agree with that. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what happens going forward with uh, consumer confidence in whether it's events, 
Um, I was hoping by fall of 2020, everything would be kind of back to normal. And now it's looking like, gosh, will it even be back to normal at 2021? Sure. Thank you. Um, I want to touch on a couple or delve a little further into a couple of issues that we've touched on here. And the one that jumps immediately to mind, we have obviously a kind of a broad cross section of, of the hospitality industry around this table today. Um, <clears throat> some larger operators, some smaller operators, and across both the restaurant, lodging, and retail beverage industries. The one thing that I hear, there's sort of two issues, and I'll start with, uh, Shannon, you just kind of touched on both of them, but I want to delve a little more deeply into um, not just what the issue was, but how it's improved and how folks have been flexible um, in terms of overcoming it. But the first one I want to touch on is the supply chain issue. Um, you mentioned the takeout containers. I think it was Lisa actually early on in, in this process when uh, bars and restaurants had been asked to close or switch to a takeout or carry out or delivery only model. Um, I think Lisa said to me at one point, we're gonna run out of to-go containers. And I said, well, yeah, okay, um, call your supplier, what have you. And she said, no, Rudy, everybody is gonna run out of to-go containers. And so I know there were Obviously, around the table, and maybe um, I'll address this first to uh, Dusty and Mike, as the two guys are sort of more on the restaurant industry end of it. Um, what was that like, and how have you uh, been, how have you dealt with having to switch over that model from a dine-in, at least temporarily, and how much of your business remains kind of under that, that to-go or delivery um, side of things? And has, with reopening, has the dine-in, what's that proportion like versus what it was pre-COVID? You want to start, Mike? Sure. I'd be happy to. Um, well, to answer your question, we're uh, at 75% capacity uh, as we speak. And um, so we have, we've been uh, surprised at the number of sales that we have had based on uh, um, our, our capacity. But... I will also tell you that about 10% of our business now is takeout carryout, and previously it, w it was zero. And what happened was the this city of Dickinson allowed us to have a couple of parking spots in front of our office for takeout carryout, and they also allowed us to have growlers. And, and we're in a little different scenario that we've we've created a, a catering side, and we've reached out to different events to cater to their events. So that has also helped with our sales. Uh, I will tell you, we're running about even with last year at this point in time. Now, in March and April, obviously, we're down 60 plus percent and then gradually uh, getting back to, to, to even uh, as far as sales are concerned. We're not obviously back even uh, from where we were last year by any stretch. But I'll tell you that uh, takeout, carryout, catering, and, and some of those uh, things have helped us tremendously. In addition to that, we have a second floor that we've not utilized before, and at the present time, uh, we're probably about 70% completed with that, and we want to host special events up there. So we're doing different things to, to modify our business model. We put in a new point of sale system uh, that makes it far more efficient. So again, it, it forced us to be, in my mind, better operators, but I really want to compliment uh, our local city commission, our CVB, our um, the Greater North Dakota Chamber, uh, Bank of North Dakota, and uh, and uh, the Commerce Department. They've all done a wonderful job in, in getting uh, information out to us, uh, the programs that are available, and so um, we're doing okay right now. I, I'm, I'm uh, cautiously optimistic, and obviously we put a plan B together. If our sales go down by 50, 60 percent, we've got a plan for that too, so. Very good. Well, on, in my world with uh, the Applebee's across North Dakota, uh, we've always had takeout since about 2003, 2004. So it wasn't a big learning curve for us. The learning curve was that's all we had. So when we're used to doing 10, 8 to 12 percent, depending on the market, we went from 8 to, 8 to 12 percent to that's all we do in our kitchen, trying to funnel through everything from there. We had just started um, uh, some different ordering processes. Uh, server handhelds that we had just uh, implemented in our restaurants that were going to help the dine-in ended up not being able to use it so we had to stop the stop everything there from a standpoint of to go today our car side we were already using third-party delivery we had a little bit of catering and we had the car side um, 
when we transitioned to that's all it was, we've been able to maintain a, a good chunk of that from, from the, the biggest days that we had to where we are today. Right now we're sitting at about anywhere between 25 to 35% of our overall business is still off premise. Um, a lot of that is third party also. As far as the question you'd asked about the distribution, um, with Applebee's it's always been nice because we've got supplies for about on towels and to-go containers, usually three, four, five months out at the distribution center. Um, our distribution center was able to get us product our suppliers were able to get us product all the way through. So we really didn't get faced with any of those challenges um, of not having it. There were some food challenges that we were, able, were not able to get at times, um, but with uh, as far as to go, we were able to maintain um, our supply level with our vendors, so they were happy. <clears throat> well, I know that in terms of some of those supply chains, folks in in businesses like Shannon's, um, were often putting stuff on the trucks that was not traditionally uh, part of that business. Can you uh, speak to that a little bit? And right. So there's a an aluminum can shortage <laughs> happening in the country, and that was something that was actually happening before um, COVID, um, because of the basically smaller suppliers, craft suppliers moving from bottles to canning um, lines and then this crazy seltzer uh, industry that is just boomed. I mean, it went from zero to it's uh, gonna be, you know, over 10% of the total beer industry um, at the end of this year. And that's almost exclusively in cans. So we were already having a shortage along with s some tariffs that were happening. Um, but I mean, just like uh, some restaurants had to go to more of a limited supply menu, um, that's what happened is everything went from think of all the liquid that we would have sold at Mike and Dusty's re bars and restaurants that were kegs because generally speaking draft beer is how um, consumers consume beer at at the on-premise generally speaking all of that stuff that usually is getting kegged now had to go into cans and bottles and for the most part the the package of choice for someone to drink at home is a can and it, it caused shortages for across the board with all suppliers. And, and like uh, Dusty and Applebee's, um, my main suppliers, Anheuser-Busch, and they had a pretty decent supply chain. But at the same time, while they said, well, we're keeping you more in stock than maybe some other suppliers, that, that caused us to use our, our employees in a different way. So instead of just stopping at you know, one liquor store once per week and you know, really filling them up, we had to make multiple stops because the beer was coming in not in a traditional, timely fashion. So, which actually probably helped us keep our employees at work too um, because we were using up more man hours just trying to keep the supply chain um, fed and keep the stores that were open or the places that we're able to do uh, to go growlers, um, you know, we really we really didn't have any kegs coming in, but they were at least able to go through their product during that month and a half of shutdown. So that's been very interesting, and it that is definitely still ongoing. Um, I know almost all of the suppliers are at 100% capacity on their canning lines. They just cannot get the aluminum. Sure. <clears throat> Absolutely. So Please do. <laughs> when do they anticipate the aluminum? You know, can you, you talked about tariffs before, but when do they anticipate that kind of freeing up? Yeah, um, that's a good question, and we have not gotten that answer from any supplier in particular. I would say Anheuser-Busch has been very good with communication about when we'll be able to get things and just telling us how much they're trying to... Um, wh what's happening is some of those brands that um, are not as popular um, I know I have a friend of mine who works in the soda industry. They went from making 28 products to just five. So some of the products that you normally see, they're just, they just have stopped making them for the next uh, three to five months. And then, then they hope that it'll kind of come back after the first of the year. But certainly through the end of the year, they're slowing down on some products that, you know, hey, you, we can make this bottle only, or we won't make as many can packages. So a, a Budweiser product might come in a suitcase, an 18-pack, a 12-pack, you know, in different can sizes. You might only see, uh, you know, a suitcase of it because it's the big packages, too. It's that pantry loading mentality that people are having. So they're, they're just trying to garner as much capacity as they can. But I, I would say they're, they're looking at three to five months for it to be an issue. So are they looking at, at the different vessels? 
Um, I don't. I don't think that they're looking at new canning lines. No, they're they're looking at um, the fact that post COVID will at least turn part of it around, and then trying to figure out what their initial issue was pre COVID. I think that was a solvable issue of, of getting more product in. Um, you know whether that was U.S. manufacturers or Chinese manufacturers. Um, you know that was a kind of a different issue, but all of a sudden it exacerbated it by. 100% for sure. Yeah, it's interesting because you, you had said they, they went from 28 to 5. Yeah. It's the same thing with the restaurants. We went from 161 menu items, boom, the next day we're at 64. Mm -hmm. And now we're just kind of bringing it back up because some of it was we just didn't have the space and have the product. So Right. And I wanted to add to that, too, when you talked about supplies. I've always been a big believer of having more than enough in terms of cleaning supplies and things like that. And as far as towels, uh, we've got towels for a very long time. And uh, backup uh, computer terminals or, or what have you, we, we've always been well stocked. And so uh, that didn't hit us as, as much. The, the thing that hit us was the, the food supply, as you uh, say. And so we had to also consolidate our menu, make some changes. And what I was um, not surprised about, but uh, very happy to see that the consumer uh, was very supportive of all of those changes because they certainly understood the the situation that we're in. But as far as supplies were concerned, the only uh, tightness I'll say is we had uh, with with food, and so we had to make some trips to uh, make sure we had enough for the weekend and this item or that item. But but reducing it definitely helped uh, us as well. So we have a uh, <clears throat> a question coming in from one of our viewers. And I'll just pose this to the group. Is liquidity becoming a problem due to low volume? If so, what can the Bank of North Dakota or Congress do to help? And how can we advocate to help the industry? That's kind of a big three-part question. And will likely lead us into um, some discussions of PPP and some other programs um, and how well those have worked and what the gaps might be. But the, the overall question, is liquidity becoming a problem due to low volume? And if so, what can folks do to help? And Mike, uh, do you have initial thoughts? Sure. And we'll pass Absolutely. it around the group. Uh, well, first of all, in North Dakota, um, we have a unique situation, I feel, with the Bank of North Dakota. And they, the state received a $1.25 billion from the, the federal government. Of that, I believe the Bank of North Dakota got about $200 million, and that was for, for loans and so forth. And they have different uh, type loans. One is a self-loan program, which is a small employer loan fund, which is uh, 10 employers, employees or less. And then PACE funding, which is two different categories, one with 500 and less, and one with 500 and one and more. So the, for the big companies, the loan uh, uh, max is 5 million and 10 million. And they have, I believe if, if you look on their website, it's about 3.75%. And for the smaller businesses, it's all the way down to 1%. But the Department of Commerce, GNDC, have done a, a remarkable job of getting information out to the public. When they're trying to formulate how they're going to help with liquidity, uh, the, de the Commerce Department sent out 11,300 uh, business surveys. They sent, uh, excuse me, uh, community surveys, over 1,800 uh, business surveys. What, uh, what are the needs? And... and and they, they had many webinars uh, uh, telling you how to uh, apply for PPP on a federal basis or get an econ economic resiliency grant from the Department of Commerce or get loans from Bank of North Dakota. Uh, you know, Eric, uh, uh, the president of the uh, Bank of North Dakota, has done a wonderful job along with his staff in, in getting that word out as well. And I know that he's going to come to us with more uh, plans in the next legislative session. So. I feel like um, the Department of Commerce, Bank of North Dakota, have done a great job uh, informing us as to what our options are. Our local bankers have done a, a, a wonderful job in reaching out. We, I didn't uh, make a phone call to our banker. Our banker called us mm -hmm. and worked us through the process and, and continues to do so. So at this point in time, liquidity for us is not a problem at this point. Um, and it's because we've, we've worked uh, together and we've also formed a small local restaurant association, working with each other, helping us, us through the, the different problems. When you talk about supplies or things like that, uh, we help each other out in that way as well. But I think um, we've got some pretty good programs here in North Dakota for, uh, for liquidity. 
Sure, thank you for that, Mike. I see another question popping up, but before we get to that, um, <clears throat> anybody else like to weigh in on this particular question? Lisa, you've been quiet for a little while. <laughs> Surprising, right? <laughs> Um, no, I mean, the, the programs that came through definitely helped us keep people employed. Um, at some point, um, the, um, the economic uh, resiliency is in process right now. So, I mean, some of those things that put in process um, have definitely helped. Um, but uh, we got a long road ahead of us. So. <laughs> Yeah, I know that um, obviously the program, the federal program that's on the tip of everyone's tongue, obviously, is the PPP, um, which has went through one round of funding, underwent some modifications. I know that there's some feeling um, under its original uh, rules and regulations and guidelines that, that the PPP was maybe not ideally suited specifically to the hospitality industry, although the feeling that I'm hearing is that once it was uh, modified by Congress and some of those rules were changed a little bit, it fits better. Um, I don't know if anyone at the at the table has additional thoughts on that program specifically, or if, uh, obviously the, the, the conversation is that it needs another round of funding. I think we can all just stipulate that, but um, have folks had a good experience with the federal programs as well? I mean, uh, obviously Mike rightly pointed out the, the state programs that are available and the great job we've done at the state level, but um, how are folks feeling about the federal programs and their availability? I actually have a question for Dusty because I, I know that we applied for the PPP and we had a pretty good experience other than the fact that the rules kept changing in the middle of the game. <laughs> and I get that. That was something that the federal government had to do turn around quickly and you've got very polarized sides so I understand why that had to happen but as an Apple core and franchise versus corporate how were your places um, how did that affect I guess you know I know big corporations couldn't really the PPP loans couldn't happen but as a local store were you able to to, to utilize the PPP yeah. or we were able to apply for it we had a, we had a good experience Is that too also. personal <laughs> no we had we had a good experience with it also um, the, the local banks uh, were very helpful. They got engaged with it right from the get-go, were able to answer questions. The struggle with it um, was it was always changing. Right. So initially it was, okay, you know, it had to be this amount was for this, 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 and this as a percentage of what you were able to borrow. And as that continuously changed, there's, there's going to be a need for additional support. Uh, I think the state of North Dakota has come up with a couple different programs that um, help out small and larger businesses. Um, the biggest challenge is how long do you have to manage this? Mm -hmm. That's, that's going to be the ongoing challenge. Is, is this another two months? Is it another six months? Is it another 18 months? And that's going to dictate if people are going to have the cash on hand to you know, continue to be in business. I mean, that's where we were lucky. We're, we're, uh, because we were able to get this loan, I think we fall in a place that's kind of, you know, it's, not, it's, it's certainly not too high, and we... My front office folks did a good job of basically r write down everything and anything that we could have, uh, but we didn't over borrow certainly. Um, but the unknowns of what's going to happen, and if that all these federal programs go away, you know we're still gonna maybe we didn't need that loan up until now, but we certainly you know proved that we had some some issues during the shutdown of the on premise, where you know in order to keep our people fully employed, you know it was it was a great program. But the liquidity side, when you don't have inventory, all of a sudden you've got that. So um, that that's been the interesting is our, you know, just looking at our books. It's just been kind of a weird thing to look at. But certainly cautiously optimistic. But I'm not doing cartwheels that we made it through just yet. That's for certain. I, I agree with you 100%. I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, I I can say though, with the hotel industry, we have we we did see an uptick in the leisure. Um, Come Labor Day, what's going to happen? Um, kids now being back in sc back in school and they're um, hybrid, that doesn't allow parents to go back to work full time. So they're not there's not the corporate travel out there. W there's still the scare out there that conferences and and so we're we're definitely looking at the road ahead and and a little um, little worried about what's going to happen down the road. Have we hit our bottom yet? Board right now, if everything stays kind of how we know it, is the staffing piece, and it's mm -hmm. we rely at least in our business we rely heavily on that uh, the mom that has the two kids, and we get them coming back every August, and we get them 
through some holidays. We get them August, usually August through May. They, they can't really come to work because they don't know when they're going to be home, when they're not going to be home. Is it a hybrid school year? Is it this? Is it that? And that does, that poses a, a huge problem for us for daytime staffing. Um, hopefully we can work with some of them and convert them to working maybe a couple nights because they need the income also um, or on weekends but then their whole family dynamics are going to change around where it it's a good position for that type of person knowing that they can drop their kid off at school come work a few hours and be at school to pick their pick their child up but Basically, we, our industry has no work at home options or very few work at home options for any of our employees or our staff. I mean, if it would be a very small handful in the entire industry. And that's where, as an employer, that's the difficult part about the hybrid schools. And the PPP was not designed for long term. Um, I believe that uh, when you fill out a loan application, it's for eight weeks worth of payroll utilities, rent, things like that. And of course, there's been some modifications since that time. So. Uh, th that, that question is a very good question because you know we're all sitting here wondering what the world's going to look like in November, December, who's going to be president and, and what's, uh, are we going to have a vaccine? Um, but again, we, we plan for uh, uh, this to continue until we, we see something different. But the, the PPP definitely helped with, with our liquidity uh, for the short term, but again, not a long term thing. Sure, we do have a couple more uh, questions coming in from, from the viewers. One of them, I guess, we're sort of talking around right now, so I'll just ask it directly since it's been asked directly of us. Is this group feeling like there's a pickup and are optimistic, or are we still looking for the light at the end of the tunnel? I mean, it depends on the week. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think like everybody out there, um, you know, one week I'm feeling really optimistic, and, you know, we're, we're thinking that we're getting through it, and then... You know, something new comes out, and it's like, wow, what's going to happen? You know, next week. So um, it, it's a it's a struggle every day to try to try to decide which which way um, to even think anymore. Right now, it's, it's it seems like you're always looking at okay, well, what's the next holiday? So we made it through Memorial Day, then you have July Fourth. Now we have Labor Day, and it's it seems to always be some spikes right after some of those major holidays and kind of just hanging firm and see what happens at the schools. Right. You know, that's, that's going to play, a, I think, a play a big part um, of what the future looks like. If, if kids are back home, everything looks a little bit different. I mean, even from a, a restaurant's perspective, people start doing takeout versus doing dine-in. And it, it just, it's hard to say. It's, it's hard to know. I don't think we're at the uh, end of the tunnel because you, there's still a, a uh, high number of tests that we're doing, a high number of positive cases, and so how's that going to affect your staff? And uh, or are they uh, a husband or a spouse c gets COVID and then they have to quarantine? So we're still sitting on the edge of our seats to see um, uh, get this thing a little bit more under control. But um, I agreed with what uh, Dusty said a little bit earlier. There probably needs to be another round if this of uh, funding if this continues like this. Um, so. I think we're still in the middle of it. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I think all of us, you know, want to look positive in the future. <laughs> yes. But, you know, you, you just never know from one day to the next day. And for our industry, there's already been so many uh, event-based things that are already canceled. So college football, that plays a huge role in your businesses and in mine. So I'm not going to go to Applebee's and watch the Bison play. Um, anymore. Um, I'm not going to even host a party at my house if I'm not comfortable to go, uh, you know, to Mike's uh, place to, to watch the Bison because I can't watch the Bison. I mean, my, my son's football, high school football team gets to play on ESPN. I'm like, that's a silver lining, but that's certainly, <laughs> we're talking now already months out where we've got some kind of major industry events that, that have already been canceled and that are, are, or are not going to happen in the way that they traditionally would. I mean, just look at one event like, one huge event like the McQuaid softball tournament. That comes into town, you have all those hotel rooms filled. Yep. Every one of those hotel rooms are filled. A lot of the participants and fans go to the off sale. They buy there, they go to the grocery store, buy food, they stay at the hotel, they order takeout, they come to our restaurants. They go to the retail and shop. With one tournament like a McQuaid gets canceled, that's thousands and thousands and thousands of impressions in retails and restaurants and hotels 
that kind of go away and you just don't get it back. Uh, absolutely. And it's the events, it's the concerts, it's um, con you know going back to conferences, it's going back to just everyday life. It has just completely changed. And it, you know, like Dusty said, it not only affects our hotel rooms, it affects the restaurants, but also ex it, it goes downhill from there. It, uh, it affects their suppliers. Um, you know, dealing with some of our clients, our clients aren't even there anymore. We're calling up to our contact for a business and they're, they're not there because they've been furloughed. So it's, it's affected, it's, it's taken the downhill swoop of affecting so many different people and not just this top tier either. So when you started off, you had, you had full closures for the most part, you had, you had takeout business you could have, at least from the restaurant perspective. Well, then you went to 50% occupancy. Well, 50% occupancy means 50% staffing. <laughs> so there's 50% of our staff that aren't getting shifts, that aren't getting jobs, mm -hmm. or don't have the income coming in. We go up to 75%. Well, in the restaurant world, there's no difference between the 50 and 75. There just isn't. Some, some restaurants might have an extra floor, they might have a little bit more space, but there isn't a lot of additional, you, it's hard to get to that 75 with six foot social distancing. But you're also impacting a 50% less income coming in, but you also have 50% less staff who are working. So there are some questions coming in from the viewers that kind of directly address uh, what we're talking about here. I want to make sure and include them. Um, I'm going to kind of put two of these questions together. Um, the first is some economists have, and I've seen this statistic as well on a nationwide level, some economists have estimated that 40% of bars and restaurants will close due to this pandemic. The first question is, does this group agree with that statistic? And then I'm going to kind of fold in the second question as well, which is, are hotels, bars, and restaurants forever changed, um, the ones that do stay open? Specifically looking for setups, menus, other operating procedures. Is there an anticipated need for big remodels? Um, so I guess whoever would like to take the first crack at that. Well, some of the big changes are positive changes. You know, for years and years and years, we've been trying to do touch-free payment. And the banking industry just didn't allow it to happen in a lot of cases. Mm -hmm. But now it's the norm. It's what you. It's what our guest is looking for. It's, it's what we have to give to our to our guest. So you're seeing a lot of technology coming out with touch with uh, um, you know bring your own devices, using your own cell phones to make payments, using the QR codes. You know, Ten years ago, the QR code came out. It lasted about a half hour, but people were utilizing a QR code for a brief moment in time. Now any place you go has a QR code menu. So you scan the QR code, you see what the whole menu looks like. So there's some stuff that has happened because of this that is positive and is going to be good for the greater good long term. Um, there's some other stuff that it's going to be it's going to be interesting, and we still don't know what that looks like. At least in my eyes, I still don't know what that looks like. It's how long do you stay with the six foot social distancing? How long do you do stuff like this? You see a lot of restaurants putting partitions up, hotels. You walk into a hotel, it's all plexiglass across the board. Um, in a lot of cases, it's, uh, it's you do your transaction, they leave, they come back, they, they finish that transaction. So it's really what the, what the consumer, what the, what the guest expectation is. Mm -hmm. You know, for restaurants and hotels, sanitations typically have always been pretty high from a standpoint. We've, it's, it has to be even higher now and in heightened and uh, you know, making sure that it's clean consistently, not just, you know, periodically in some cases, but that's my, my belief. Well, my, I think that's <clears throat> beneficial for restoring consumer confidence as well, absolutely. is that we as an industry have always kind of prided ourselves on the fact that, you know, we're serving food and we're, people sleep here. And so the, the cleanliness uh, has always been a priority. Obviously, the global pandemic has caused increased attention to be placed on that, but some of the technologies that you talk about, QR code menus and that kind of thing, I agree with you, are positive developments in the long term, um, but are good for restoring that, that consumer confidence as well, which is going to be a critical element in this industry's full recovery. Um, yes, Mike. Uh, I don't know about the 40%. Uh, I know there's some states where these bars and restaurants have been forced to be closed for a long time, and so I, I, I can't imagine that uh, there wouldn't be a significant number that would, uh, wouldn't fail. If you look at, go back to the PPP for just a second, uh, the payroll um, was meant, or, or the eight weeks was meant to pay uh, every employee at their full rate. 
meaning that even if you, if you use 40% of your employees, all of them had to be paid uh, so that we're keeping the economy going to the level that they were before. Um, and I'll tell you this, that as Dusty said, that it's forced us to become better operators. So we do have the handheld. We do have the, uh, we're going to have the online and we are reaching out to catering. So I, I do think there's a new normal going to be out there. I do think that there'll be a higher percentage of people that will work from home than did prior to all of this. And then how are they going to, how are they going to eat their lunch? How are they going to eat their supper? And so I would suspect that, that the takeout carryout will probably be a bigger portion of our business going forward because if people are in a Zoom meeting, they're going to want to pick up something to eat and, and get back to their uh, uh, home. Or, um, so I do think there's, uh, there's going to be a, a little bit of a new normal going forward. I agree. I think with the, with the hotels, um, you know, same thing. We have new social distancing tools that we can set up um, like we are all set six feet apart, um, we can, we've um, reached out and found new tools to help show that to our customers and really reach out to let the customer know that we'll do whatever they can to make them feel, their group feel comfortable coming back and, and taking care of them. I think just getting back to Mike's point on the, the percentage of the businesses that won't come back, I definitely think that North Dakota, as a as someone who has about 300 plus customers that would be considered in that group, um, I'm not hearing a lot of panic that they're going to have to shut down completely. Now they may have, you know, other ties to other industries where, you know, if they're a hotel re um, restaurant or if they're smaller, or if you know they if they're more mom and pop and you know somebody I, I gets hit, I think that's the more more of their concern is, hey, I'm. XYZ restaurant or bar and I opened up and you know had to be at 50% capacity so already I'm not making that great amount of money I'm not employing 100% of my staff back and now we just had to shut down again for another two weeks because we had some exposure and I think the opening and reclosing is what's actually uh, seems to be what I'm hearing the feedback is hitting them harder than when they were shut down for for a month and a half, but I think the industry uh, percentages, you know, deals with the nationwide where there's been states where they just simply aren't open for more than a month and a half, so they well, were shut I, down. I heard a statistic from the National Restaurant Association the other day that there's roughly 100,000 restaurants in this country that are currently enduring a second round of, of mandated closures mm -hmm. from their state or local governments, so that that is when it becomes really tough. Um, so another question where we've kind of alluded to it in the discussion so far, but uh, someone, uh, one of our viewers, decided to ask it just a little more directly. So I'll just read it <laughs> right as it's written. Workforce, are they coming back? We want them to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> depends what the, the, I think it depends on what, what happens in November. I think it depends on what happens with a vaccine. I think it depends on what happens with the how customers can start to feel confident to go back out and start to resume a somewhat normal back to normal life if that there ever is a back to normal. I would agree with all of that. Um, the only thing that I would add is that as, as humans we want social interaction and I know of, of some uh, elderly relatives that I have and other people have, uh, they're, they're cooped up. And it's very, very difficult uh, to do that and not be able to visit relatives and so forth. So I would hope that <clears throat> once we get through this, and I guess I'm an eternal optimist, that, that we'll get through this. Um, it's just how long will it take for us to get the vaccine and get past this and what's the next challenge. But as human beings, we need social interaction and our businesses are part of that. You know, the conventions, the, the, the you know, eating out, things like that. People want to be out and about. So. Hopefully that comes sooner than later. As far as the workforce, um, you know, it, it has been a challenge um, with the additional money that was given out uh, each week um, to get those people to come back and work um, or to get people to work, period, in some cases. Um, you know, I think we're all in the same boat. You can talk to pretty much any of, any, anybody in hospitality. There's plenty of jobs available, and we're not, we're not getting people coming in to apply for them. Uh, we're in we're in 
in big need and in some cases being at 50 or 75 percent capacity I don't know if I could be at 100 percent capacity because with, the, staff's because the staffing is not there and it started with that additional six hundred dollars a week and when you when you pay somebody not to work it makes it challenging to get people to come to work that's bottom line and during this time I think we found new types of ways to do things without the work without some workforce and you know let's hope that that doesn't remain the the um, bar that we all expect because I mean like I said we we customer service is so important and that you can go in and you can check out and and you know do that do the self um, checkouts and all that but that smile that hello um, meeting in person that is is just needed and I you know let's hope that we we get that workforce back to create that customer service back to where it was I think the workforce in this industry was already tough to get before this certainly <laughs> yeah. there's no question mm -hmm. and it's because you know it's it's the stay-at-home moms that you know they can only work certain hours and now that's become more complicated um, you know take away the PPP or the unemployment extra six hundred dollars because I think some people will find well I should have gone back to work because now I got to pay that back but it's gonna be months before anything like that gets cleared up for us, it, it was interesting. We were actually, we're a small company, only 32 employees. So we were actually down, we were looking for a full-time position to hire right before it hit. And we said, you know, we can probably make it through this without. Um, and now that we're trying to fill, fill that, I thought people would be looking to get back to work. I thought, oh, we're gonna get all kinds of great applications where it had been, the last couple of years had been pretty tough. And we, very, very few applications, which surprised me because I did think people were trying to find work, um, but well, that's not the case. In the hospitality, you see people not reopening parts of their dining rooms because they don't have staff for it. Uh, drive through restaurants that aren't having dine in because they can't staff um, the inside. And it's not just the counter help, but it's people that might be, um, you know, cleaning and stuff like that. So that's one less part of the business they have to worry about. You're seeing it in all. All, all walks of restaurants. I mean, it's you'll see simplified menus in, a lo, in almost every restaurant, and you continue to see that until the staffing levels come back, because you you have to have a simplified menu. Uh, almost every restaurant immediately went to a 40% a reduction in their menu, and part of that was staffing availability. Sure. Uh, we have another question coming in, and I'm. I think I'm going to take the first crack at this one. The, the, <laughs> the specific question is, is there a mentality in this industry of dog eat dog or are you collaborating among each other? And I'll, I'll just point out that that is kind of the, the point of the existence of the North Dakota Hospitality Association is to collaborate with each other. And we've been doing that for decades now. Um, I know that Mike, you had alluded to some of that happening um, I, at your local level um, in Dickinson. I think, you know, generally speaking, I think most of us in this industry would consider ourselves friendly competitors and um, still willing to, you know, reach out a hand to a guy down the block if he needs it. But uh, I don't know if others have more specific thoughts on that. I will tell you that um, I reached out to uh, eight to ten restaurants and I'll found that they were very willing to share information. Uh, the local general manager of our McDonald's has been wonderful. I mean, when you take a national chain and they do things differently, obviously, than small shops, and we have a few, quite a few small restaurants in Dickinson, but we're all in the same boat. So the question that when we did meet by Zoom, it was, well, what are you doing about this? Or what are you doing about that? Got a lot of good ideas, good suggestions. So I would tell you that I think we're still North Dakota nice. I think that we uh, still work hard to do whatever we can to support other businesses. Uh, let's face it, um, I utilize, I, I go to Applebee's, I go to the other restaurants in town and uh, you wanna see them do well. And so I, I would think that it's not, it, it, I don't think it's dog eat dog in our, in our part of the state. And, and uh, I think it's been one that's been very collaborative and I, I feel very comfortable calling up just about any other restaurant in our community and saying, um, can I get some advice from you? And vice versa, I've gotten phone calls as well. So I think it's, we're still North Dakota nice. I agree. I think even whether it's a restaurant, a bar, a hotel, we're, 
we're, we're all in the same boat. We're all looking for ideas. We're all, actually, we're all looking for just being able to talk about it and, and work some, some of our feelings out on it. I also would point out in terms of uh, collaboration, just from the association perspective, um, when the executive branch was looking at a variety of different industries and under what conditions uh, folks might be able to return to more normalized operations. Obviously, no one's fully back to normal yet, but um, was really pleased with the collaboration and grateful to the uh, to the executive branch for reaching out to us as an association to help um, help them kind of talk through and determine what the shape of those guidelines might be. We were we were very grateful to have input into that process and and make it as painless as possible for the industry while still, you know, keeping public health at the front of mind and, and doing everything we need to do for our, for our consumers and for our customers and neighborhoods. So um, in terms of the spirit of collaboration, it's not just within the industry. I like to feel like we have a pretty good uh, working relationship with our local governments and with the state government as well. Um, speaking of, this, that actually brings me back to a point I was going to mention earlier that some city ordinance changes. There, are, obviously, there are folks here who operate in multiple cities, and it, it hasn't just been the state government that's been responding to um, this pandemic situation. Obviously, various different local governments have done so as well in terms of, you know, altering some ordinances surrounding um, alcohol sales. With curbside to go, for example, is one that jumps to mind. Um, so has the, have those types of local ordinance changes generally been helpful and should they stay? Or if not, when should they revert is my question to the group. I guess my answer to that is uh, in Dickinson, uh, the city commission uh, allowed us to sell growlers even though that's not in our restaurant liquor license so we could move some of our inventory. In addition to that, as I said before, they allowed us to have some uh, takeout carryout uh, parking spots in front of our restaurant. We were able to put signage there. And um, the the second floor, they gave us an, an extension to our liquor license so that when we were at 50%, we were able to use some of our second floor even though it wasn't completely done. Um, as far as, uh, so the, we can no longer sell growlers because we're open. And, and I agree with that because um, there's other, as Shannon uh, pointed out prior to the, the this conference, uh, this panel, that there's different types of liquor licenses and there, sh there should be fairness and equity uh, throughout. And so if someone has a full liquor license, they should be able to sell growlers, whereas uh, they allowed us to do it temporarily and I thought that was the right thing to do. We can't do it anymore and I'm totally fine with that. I totally understand it. But I think our local government really stepped up and helped us uh, because the turnaround time and our request to, to getting something uh, done was very, very short. And I would say as, as someone who, uh, who is a wholesaler in the beer industry and we had our kegs sitting there for a month and a half with code dates, I mean, it's a perishable product, a perishable product, not like milk, um, but we had, I, I, think, I think that the overall feeling that I heard back was at first that bars and restaurants wanted, you know, the ability to, to do the curbside pickup for alcohol. Um, and, uh, you know, whether or not people actually took advantage of that and it really helped them clear through product as someone who sells product to those uh, customers, um, I would say that it was more, it was more like a feel-good thing. It probably wasn't bringing in extra. I mean, they were going to do the takeout. Um, but that said, I know that the suppliers as well, um, you know, made sure that Rest, I mean, that it wasn't just all felt on restaurants and bars. It was sort of, it's a three-tier system, so it was felt on all three tiers. I mean, we ate 50% of the cost. The suppliers ate 50% of our cost. You guys had to go through some, some beer. Some code dates were extended, so I think that helped. But I, I do think that the city ordinances helped, certainly. And I, and I know that the, the, the restaurants around in, in Bismarck, for sure, Bismarck Mandan, were appreciative of being able to, you know, bottle some things up or package some growlers up. Well, we have just about 10 minutes left. Um, Gig and note here that international markets or the absence of international travel um, is huge on the chat right now amongst the people who are watching. Uh, does anyone in this group have any brief thoughts on that or like to address that as a uh, factor that's impacting business at the moment? 
statistics uh, that I've seen that people are doing more staycations than vacations. So that uh, changes how you, um, how you target your, your customers or uh, do your marketing, and that is that people probably do a lot more staycations within 100 and 200 miles of, of home rather than taking a trip internationally or even through other states. So the percentages will tell you that, that I've seen will tell you that people are going to stay a lot closer to home uh, through, this pro through this period anyway. As far as the international, with the Canadian traffic being <laughs> completely gone <laughs> as of right. right now, especially for us in some of our markets in the northern part of the state and also in Fargo being, you know, kind of the retail hub of North Dakota, um, we're, we're not seeing it. And it does make a big difference from hotel stays to retail to restaurants to off sales. I mean, it. when someone travels, it flows through everybody in this room. It, the, the dollars flow through and through, and it's it's not coming from north anymore right it, the, the hotels i mean definitely there's no foreign international travel um with the canadian border closed those people are not coming down and and visiting um north dakota or south dakota um, but you're absolutely right what we're seeing in the hotel industry is if they are traveling it is within 100 to 200 miles and they're going they're they're looking for things out their back door so um that is you know definitely something that um we're trying to let people know that we're here, we're open. Um, and and it's, it's, it's kind of nice seeing people all of a sudden explore North Dakota and finding things that they never found before. So, so with just a few minutes left, um, I believe we'll give every, go once more around the table and give everyone a, uh, a chance to just conclude with any final thoughts or any, any additional uh, anything you wanted to get off your chest that we haven't gotten to yet? <laughs> so maybe we'll go in uh, reverse order this time and we'll start with Mike. Well, again, thank you to the Greater North Dakota Chamber and, and you, uh, Rudy, for, for being a great moderator and to my fellow panelists. It's been uh, enjoyable for me. I, I will tell you that, <clears throat> um, as I said before, I remain an eternal optimist and I believe uh, within the next year that we'll have a uh, vaccine. But what is going to happen in between now and then? Um, so we have a plan B, and that means uh, how do we uh, run our business more efficiently? Um, as I said before, it, it's, it's forced us to become better operators, uh, utilizing different technologies and so forth. But uh, also longer term, what's the new normal going to look like? What's your consumer going to look like? What are they going to be um, reaching out for? And so I, I feel that, um, that in the short term, um, it's going to be still continue to be a battle going forward for the, at least the next several months, and uh, because anybody, any business can have employees that that get COVID or or quarantine because of COVID, COVID. So we've got to be prepared for that. Which which shoe is going to drop next? But again, I feel very um, comfortable saying that we have a, a great economy um, when we're not in these type of uh, situations. And I, I truly believe that uh, a year from now, a year and a half from now, we're going to be seeing a new normal that we've adjusted to and that we're able to um, have people that, that feel cooped up right now are going to want to get out. And I think our businesses are going to go back to being uh, very, very successful. Shannon, do you have closing thoughts? Oh, I have a lot of them. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <We got laughs> when do we minutes, get to this we beer? we got six minutes left on when the When do clock. we get to this beer? Um, no, I, I think that... Our, um, our uh, North Dakota government and our governor and uh, everyone has done a really great job. Um, I think they're doing what they need to do to slow the curve and, and, and do everything that was, that was needed to make sure our hospitals weren't at risk. And that was at the end of the day what the point of all of this was. Um, but I, I feel proud that our industry has remained flexible and has you know, become better uh, business people. And um, I think we're gonna have to continue to be flexible. Um, and uh, try to work around our supply issues and any issues that are outside of our control. And I'm also, um, and I think, I don't know that Mike actually mentioned it during the panel, but prior to this several times, you know, just the, the fact that so many people in North Dakota have supported local businesses, and I think that's going to continue to be very important. And, um, you know, whether it's takeout or eating at, at, at the sports uh, grill, um, I think if you can continue to, to support you know your local businesses we will end up getting through this and the light at the end of the tunnel will be seen at some point so 
Dusty, final thoughts? Yeah, just kind of a lot of the same stuff. I, I, I uh, believe it's going to all work out when it's all said and done. It's just a matter of what does each day look like. Um, you know, everybody's, everybody I know is working hard to try to, you know, make everything as safe and, and as uh, inviting as possible. Um, the, the state of North Dakota, I, I believe, has done a pretty good job, really good job, of communicating what's going on, expectations, and not just kind of slamming stuff down our throats, but really getting the industry leaders involved in helping writing some of those new rules and regulations and really asking questions um, to make it the best situation that it can be considering what situation we are in. So um, hats off to the state of North Dakota for you know kind of stepping up in some of those in those areas. Sure. Lisa? Well, too, I want to um, thank the Greater North Dakota Chamber and, and Rudy and the panel here. Um, I think it was great to open up, if, if some people didn't know, to open up the eyes of what some of these hospitality um, businesses are going through. Um, but just to reiterate what everybody says, we are all open for business and we're doing everything we can to create the safe, safest environment for our customers and we're willing to work with you in, in any way. So um, thank you. Perfect. Well, to that end, Shannon did supply us here on the panel with some, uh, some beverages. So I'd just like to conclude the panel again by thanking the Greater North Dakota Chamber for hosting and inviting all of us here. Uh, thanks, Shannon, for the beverages. And I'd just like to offer up a toast to uh, the future of our industry and all of those who support it. Cheers. 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 Thank you. This session is now complete. Thank you to all that made this conversation possible, including panelists, moderators, and our sponsors.